Um, so this afternoon, uh, the objectives of my presentation um, are to raise awareness of the challenges or barriers to end-of-life care among different cultural and ethnic groups, to discuss uh, the cultural context for a palliative approach and end-of-life care for patients, um, and to provide sample questions um, that healthcare providers can use to explore the cultural beliefs and values of patients um, at end of life. And before I get into uh, my presentation um, pretty well, what I'd like to do is just position myself to let you know that uh, I'm not a clinician by training, as you might have gathered um, with the introduction that Amy did for me. Um, but uh, I am interested in uh, access to care for ethnic minority older adults. And uh, as a member of uh, a student member on iPanel, um, I was uh, asked to present on this topic because of my interest uh, with ethnocultural minority older adults, their access to care, and my interest in end of life care in long term care settings. So um, I look forward then. Um, to a mutual uh, learning uh, through the presentation that I'm going to be doing. Um, I prepared this presentation based on key references um, from the literature, and so I look forward uh, to uh, uh, learning from you as well. Now, to achieve uh, these objectives, um, I've divided my presentation into three sections. Um, first, I'll provide some background about why we need to think about a palliative approach and why we should be thinking about how to provide end-of-life care to different ethnocultural groups. Um, and I'll also discuss um, the barriers to providing culturally appropriate uh, end-of-life care. I will then move to the middle part of the presentation, which will be a discussion of the cultural context um, for a palliative approach and end-of-life care. And then I'll end with uh, suggestions for developing a uh, culturally aware end of life um, uh, practice and sample questions um, that can be used to explore the cultural beliefs of patients um, at end of life. The initiative for a palliative approach in nursing, evidence and leadership, or iPanel, is a practice relevant nursing health services research initiative uh, that has been funded by the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research. Members of my panel, uh, who are listed here, conduct research to inform how best to integrate a palliative approach into the care of people with advancing chronic life-limiting conditions, such as heart, lung, and kidney disease, dementia, etc. The iPanel team, as you can see, consists of academic nurse researchers from a number of universities uh, and practice leaders from a range of health authorities in British Columbia, as well as uh, the BC Ministry of Health. So what is a palliative approach? It's really an approach to care that's focused on improving the quality of life of persons with life-limiting conditions and their families. It's provided in all healthcare settings and involves physical, psychological, social, and spiritual care. The palliative approach is not delayed until the end stages of an illness, but rather is applied earlier to provide active, comfort-focused care uh, and a positive approach to reducing suffering. It also promotes understanding of loss and bereavement. So what are the issues uh, that I want to talk about today or make the case for uh, what I'm recommending um, today? First, three quarters of British Columbians die without being identified as individuals who could benefit from a palliative approach. Historically, hospice palliative care has been offered only to people who are in the last weeks or months of life when all curative treatments have been exhausted, and the focus of care shifts from cure to comfort. But illness trajectories are now changing. In the past, many Canadians uh, would die suddenly from, from a heart attack, stroke, or organ failure, 
or they would have a diagnosis like cancer um, or AIDS that had a recognizable terminal phase. However, the predictable decline um, that uh, is, not, is really no longer the case or as common now, uh, with two-thirds of Canadians living with two or more life-limiting chronic conditions. Thus, when they will die is less predictable than uh, we would see in the past with uh, cancer and AIDS. Thirdly, people are dying in many settings, in residential care facilities, general hospital wards, at home. And added to all of this is the challenge of a culturally diverse Canadian population that may have different beliefs and values related to death and dying, how they view a good death and end of life care due to culture, ethnicity, and religion. So in 2011, nearly 21% of Canada's population was foreign born. And this proportion is expected to increase to 25 to 28% by 2031. One out of every five people in 2011 belonged to a visible minority group. And by 2031, one third of the foreign born population will belong to a visible minority group. So you can see that uh, because of immigration, uh, the ethnic composition of our Canadian population is changing quickly. South Asians are the largest visible minority group in Canada and the second largest in British Columbia. And together, the three largest visible minority groups, South Asians, Chinese, and Blacks, accounted for 61% of the total visible minority population in Canada. One also sees diversity um, with respect to religion in the Canadian population. Two thirds of the Canadian population was affiliated uh, with the Christian faith and consistent with changing immigration uh, patterns, there were growing proportions of the population who reported religious affiliation other than Christian, including Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, and Buddhist traditions or religions. Nearly one quarter of the Canadian population has no religious affiliation, which is a, a very important thing for the, for the presentation that I'm doing and, and for end of life care for us to note. The statistics that I'm presenting here are from the most recent uh, survey, the National Household Survey that was released uh, just uh, recently and from Statistics Canada, the projections of the diversity of the Canadian population. So uh, when we look at the cultural diversity in Canada, we see that it likely would require that healthcare providers manage complex differences in attitudes, worldviews, expectations, communication styles, and even multiple languages. Research has shown that people in ethnocultural communities make less use of palliative care services than would be expected. And failure to use uh, such services should not really be thought of as that services are not needed. Rather, the lack of use of services may be related to the fact that they are culturally and linguistically limited to those in the majority population. Now, people in all cultures experience death in ways that are relevant to their philosophy of life and their philosophy of dying and death. Communication issues that are inherent in the dying and death stage of life are strongly influenced by the cultural view of life and death. So for example, in the Western view of illness, we tend to want to know as much as we can about uh, the illness we have and the prospects for care. And many of us want to know this information directly from the healthcare practitioner, him or herself. However, in some cultures, there are values that suggest that the diagnosis and prognosis is not shared with the person who is in the last stage of life, but is only shared with family members who then decide the amount of information that they want to convey to their loved one. 
And an example of this is in the traditional uh, Chinese culture. In addition to this uh, sort of cultural specific view of truth telling, the inability to access information and to communicate effectively may also reduce uh, people's ability to seek appropriate health services, including end-of-life care. In addition, there may not be adequate words in a particular dialect uh, to translate and express the type of illness that an individual is diagnosed with, and thus uh, error is also possible. Other uh, barriers uh, to the provision of end-of-life care to different ethnocultural groups include cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity, and cultural competence. Cultural awareness is the ability to acknowledge differences. Cultural sensitivity in the healthcare context refers to the health professional's understanding of how culture may shape their patient's views and the health professional's ability then to acknowledge and respect those differences. Clark and Phillips, one of the resources uh, that I referenced in the preparation of this presentation, comment that, quote, the health professional must be respectful of their patient's belief systems while mature enough to reflect on their personal beliefs, unquote. So healthcare providers themselves inherit their belief systems from their ethnicity of origin, and they adapt these belief systems to their place of residence. In addition, health professionals also adopt the culture of medicine or nursing, which often has its own language, belief systems, and values that may require translation and explanation to, to lay people. Uh, cultural competence, then, is an amalgam of skills, abilities, capabilities, and competencies that are necessary for the establishment of respectful and culturally appropriate uh, communications and relationships. Rather than just appreciating um, different beliefs or values, cultural competence illustrates a healthcare provider's skills when approaching a consultation or providing care to a person outside of the healthcare provider's cultural group. The healthcare system itself can also be a barrier to end of life care. Overall, the Canadian healthcare system reflects Anglo-centric values, beliefs, and culture. In addition, the system's capacity for, to foster culturally competent palliative care delivery by addressing the socioeconomic gradient, systemic and institutional discrimination, and gaps in understanding between culture and health uh, are important factors to improving access to end-of-life care. So delivering culturally appropriate care is founded on mutual trust, respect of the patient's nationality, culture, age, gender, and political and religious beliefs. So uh, moving into the next section of the presentation, I think it's helpful at this point to understand how culture, ethnicity, and religion are defined or understood. Culture can be thought of as, or can be understood as the beliefs, practices, and values of particular groups. However, Anderson and Reimer Kirkham argue that culture is really more uh, or represents more than just the beliefs, practices, and values of particular groups. Culture is also located within a constantly shifting network of meanings, which are uh, enmeshed or entangled within historical, social, economic, and political processes. Therefore, the assumption that culture is something that is concrete and static or applicable to all members of a group leads to stereotyping of, of groups uh, often as problematic or difficult uh, to care for. And research has shown that, in fact, immigrants have been found to adapt their cultural practices to their environments. Um, and I can give you an example of that uh, where 
in the, in the South Asian or in the uh, Asian culture, filial piety is of, of very great importance, where the children are expected to care for their parents and, and to, to serve their needs once they've, um, they've grown up. Um, and with regard, and, and, and in, in terms of, the, uh, of, of uh, acquiring care for their, for their parents or, or in taking care of their parents, uh, the ideal is to care for them at home and to support them. But uh, researchers found that when you're looking at dementia care, th these uh, groups have now been able to adapt their cultural practices uh, so that they're able to uh, articulate the filial piety or operationalize it in a way that now identifies the best care that could be provided for a family member with dementia which may not necessarily be uh, caring for them at home. Uh, ethnicity can be defined as a group, uh, group's shared cultural heritage based on common ancestry, language, music, food, and religion. However, uh, there is also intra-ethnic group variation, and dementia researchers have found more variation within ethnic groups than between groups with regard to dementia, ethnicity, and caregiving. And when you look at religion, uh, religion can be understood as the belief in a divine or superhuman power or powers to be obeyed and worshiped as the creator or creators and ruler or rulers of the universe. So one of the cornerstones of cross-cultural care and practice is the importance of considering each person as a unique individual. It's important to treat all individuals uniquely, not as a member of a cultural group who is expected to believe certain things and behave in a certain way. So uh, there are several aspects then of end-of-life care where personal beliefs and cultural influences might have an impact. Uh, these include physical care, communication, ethical decision-making, rituals and ceremonies, grief and mourning, spirituality, faith, and religion. And uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to discuss each of these aspects of end-of-life care and um, add a little bit more detail in terms of the cultural context related to each aspect. Physical care, then, encompasses a range of things such as the values and beliefs that surround pain and pain control, physical touch, physical privacy, physical arrangements of space, dietary and nutrition requirements, just to mention a few. Pain and pain control, um, culture can really influence the acceptability of the expression of pain, of physical pain, and the manner of expressing that pain, in, pain is being felt, and the meaning that may surround the presence of physical pain. Culture and religion can also affect the use of pain medications. So for example, Hinduism and Buddhism believe in the continuation of the state of mind at the moment of death into the next life. And as a result of that belief, uh, Hindus and Buddhists really want to ensure that their minds are kept clear. So although painkillers are welcome, they must not impair one's mental processes. In contrast, Muslims believe that because death is in the hands of God, no medicine or procedure should prolong the end of life. And for some Muslims, even the use of pain medication is controversial. The Jewish tradition uh, believes uh, in pain relief to prevent unnecessary suffering. So with these examples, you kind of see the range of how religious and cultural beliefs can impact pain and pain control. It's also important to determine the role of physical touch within a culture. Some considerations include who may touch whom and in what context. Some cultures and societies use certain hands for certain personal functions and for touch. So for example, in Arabic cultures, the left hand is used for toileting and the right for giving and taking food and other interactions of touch. In some societies, 
men and women may not touch. So it's important also to try to understand the cultural uh, beliefs around uh, physical touch. Where when we talk about physical privacy, then uh, in in some cultures it it's very important. Uh, and for example, the practice of veiling the face is essential for women from certain Middle Eastern societies and other cultures uh, may prefer to have the bed curtains uh, shut for most of the time. There may also be a need for uh, particular physical arrangements of the space. So for example, uh, some Hindus will want to be placed on the ground or on the floor um, as death approaches in a symbolic return to the earth which Hindus understand to be God's body. Followers of Islam may require that they face the East or Mecca um, as death draws near, um, and therefore the bed may need to be moved, or the patient's um, face may be turned to the right uh, as a symbol of this belief. Some religions and cultures um, also have dietary requirements and preferences that may include the types of food that may or may not be eaten, who may handle, prepare, and serve the food, and in what types of uh, containers and dishes, etc. So for example, uh, the Jewish faith and culture, Seventh-day Adventist faith, and the Islamic faith each have uh, dietary requirements. Okay, so uh, moving to the next slide. Uh, with regard to communication, uh, I did talk about communication earlier on as one of the barriers uh, to end of life care. But culture can influence certain aspects of communication in palliative and end of life care. So truth telling about diagnosis and prognosis of an illness, um, the lack of a, uh, of a common language, and nonverbal ways of communicating uh, can all be influenced by culture. And as I discussed earlier, uh, some individuals and families from different cultures may believe uh, that the truth about an illness should be kept from the patient, uh, as it would only serve to upset the individual and cause him or her to lose hope. So it's important to explore this on an individual basis. And the healthcare team then should not assume that everyone within a particular culture will approach the matter in the same way. Healthcare teams can often become very distressed in the situation where truth cannot be told because they feel that they are somehow deceiving um, the patient. This is a reflection of the very high value that North American culture faces on truth telling. One of the uh, greatest obstacles to effective communication is uh, lack of a shared language, and, and I, I mentioned that earlier as well. And the importance, therefore, of taking time, using simple words, and nonverbal communication become very important uh, in this situation. Some aspects of uh, nonverbal communication are particular to certain cultures. So for instance, direct eye contact is valued um, in the Western culture as a symbol of openness and personal strength of character. While in other cultures, such as the Aboriginal culture, direct eye contact uh, may be interpreted as rude or disrespectful. Another example is uh, the personal space or comfort zone uh, when talking or interacting with someone. For North Americans, this personal comfort zone uh, is approximately 18 inches to two feet. Um, and while in Middle Eastern and Latin cultures, the space may be shorter and people will stand closer together when interacting. So such subtle and unique customs can be misinterpreted if their basis is not understood. Now, when a person is dying, it's necessary to make decisions about uh, the goals of care uh, and whether life prolonging treatments will be utilized in care, etc. In North America, it's the custom to discuss such matters with the patient and their family, 
thus honoring patient autonomy and informed consent, uh, as well as enhancing a collaborative decision-making approach to care. Now, people from other cultures may find this approach confusing and even frightening because they would expect that the healthcare provider would know what is best for the patient, uh, for treating the patient, and would go ahead and do this. So individual autonomy may not be an integral part of uh, certain cultures. So besides uh, the differences about individual autonomy, truth-telling, informed consent, joint decision-making, other areas of ethical decision-making, which may prove challenging from a cultural viewpoint, uh, relate to artificial feeding and hydration, and the question of how far to go in prolonging life. And earlier, I shared some examples um, of a Muslim religion uh, where, one would, the, the, where a Muslim individual would not want to prolong uh, life. So cessation of treatment and non-initiation of treatment may not be acceptable practices in some cultures on the basis of culture and religious beliefs. So for example, uh, Muslims believe that God determines both the time and the nature of death for each person, and that the individual's pathway to God must be respected and not intruded upon by medical care. Therefore, no medicine or procedure should prolong the end of life. Similarly, in the Jewish uh, tradition, uh, it's generally agreed that while nothing should be done to hasten death, at the same time, impediments to the natural progress of death are to be removed. So, for example, respirators or other technologies. In contrast to the Jewish and Muslim faith, Confucian teaching in the Chinese culture instills a value in continuing to live as long as one can, worrying that there might still be some unfinished social responsibilities and giving oneself up to death too soon may be seen as an escaping of social responsibilities um, that have been delegated by heaven to that person. So some Chinese may want all measures to be taken to be kept alive for as long as possible. The role of family and friends will also vary with culture. The family system is unique uh, in terms of the roles of family members, lines of authority, gender roles, who makes decisions, who participates in family meetings, etc. So for example, while in the Western culture, the wife might be seen as a key player in decision making. In some cultures, she may not have such a significant role in decision making. Uh, and in other cultures, the eldest son or sons may make treatment decisions uh, for parents. The family may also wish to be present with the patient at all times. Uh, it may be a sign of disrespect not to visit when someone is dying. Thus, large numbers of people may wish and need to be with the patient in the dying phase of illness, at the time of death itself, and the bereavement period. The body of the deceased person may also not be able to be left alone, and prayers may need to be said continuously in the presence of the deceased person. So as you can gather, there are important religious rituals that accompany the moment of dying in almost all traditions, from uh, the Roman Catholic last rites, to turning the body to face Mecca in Islam, to chanting the name of Buddha for eight hours in Chinese Buddhism. So these rituals are essential and therefore uh, every attempt should be made to permit them. It is helpful to know what might occur so that privacy can be provided to the family, staff can be prepared, and other patients and families reassured. It's also essential for healthcare providers to know what is required in terms of the body at the time of death and thereafter. So some of the questions that healthcare providers can ask um, families include, can the deceased be touched, bathed, and prepared by, by staff? Can the person's body be moved? 
how soon must the person be buried or cremated? Um, is the body transferred to the morgue or otherwise? Grief and mourning are heavily influenced by culture as well, and culture provides the customs and guidelines for the manner of grieving, the behavior of the bereaved, what's appropriate for visitors, what people would wear, what to eat and drink, uh, what visitors may bring uh, to the bereaved. So many rituals also surround the burial and bereavement period. The purpose of such rituals may be to allow family and friends uh, to express the loss of the deceased person and to provide a means whereby others in the community can provide comfort and support uh, to the bereaved. Healthcare teams will need to know particular ways that grief will be shown when caring for a particular individual and their family and community. So for instance, the degree of overt emotion likely to be shown at the time of death will vary from culture to culture. People from Anglo-Saxon and Aboriginal traditions may not show overt signs of grief, while people of Greek, Latin, or Eastern cultures may appear very distraught and perhaps faint or feel physically weak. I'll share a personal example with you because I think it illustrates the point that I'm trying to make about uh, not uh, generalizing um, from uh, different groups to individuals and families. Um, my, my mom uh, was a palliative uh, for probably two weeks uh, in, in the hospital. And uh, so we were able to get a room where the family could be with her um, for most of the time that um, she was in the palliative phase. Um, and next door, was a Punjabi uh, family. Now, as you can see, I, I am South Asian, and the Punjabi family was next door with also uh, a dying family member. Uh, the day before my mom died, uh, they, the Punjabi family had their um, family member die. Um, and the, the way that the Punjabi family and um, friends grieve was a very overt, the overt emotion was shown. Uh, there was a, a, a loud crying and grieving. Um, and then the next day, when my mom died, um, we were very uh, quiet. Our, um, uh, our behavior, the way we grieved was very different. And uh, the nurses came up to me um, and that later that morning and said, do you, do you understand what's happened? And I said, yes, we do. And she said, and you guys are okay. And I said, yes, we're fine. And it was just that distinction of what they had observed the night before and the way we uh, tended to uh, grieve being very different, but that we were all South Asians. And um, so they were worried that we didn't understand that my mom had actually passed on. Uh, religion and culture um, are often so closely related that it can be difficult to tell from uh, which source certain practices might arise. Thus, it's important to be aware that individuals from a particular country may or may not be of the same faith, although they share a culture and cultural heritage. So, for example, people from India may be Hindu, Christian, or Muslim. There may also be intergenerational issues in terms of the degree of adherence to culture and religion. So for instance, older members of a family may hold more traditional views um, than those of their adult children or grandchildren. Religious leaders uh, may be important team members in meeting the palliative needs of individuals. Uh, they may be a source of support and comfort for the patient and the family and they can also be a source of information for the healthcare team. So it's very important to take the lead from family members and the patient about the role that faith and religion play in their lives and the role that they would like religious leaders to play in their care. Now, with regard to spirituality, uh, Ivoya Augustine, a student colleague of mine on iPanel, uh, who's also on, the, on um, listening to the presentation today, did an informative and excellent webinar presentation in January of this year entitled 
addressing spiritual needs for people with life-limiting conditions. Uh, all the webinars are archived, and if you're interested uh, in the spirituality aspect of this, um, I would uh, encourage you uh, to uh, review her presentation. She, she did an excellent job. I'm cognizant of time, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, I don't. I want to get to the end of my presentation, which is why I didn't take questions throughout. So, in developing a culturally aware end-of-life care practice, Fisher and Al, who are also noted uh, in my references, uh, note that fostering a culturally aware practice must occur on three levels: at the individual healthcare provider level, at the level of the healthcare team and at the level of the healthcare organization, program, or institution overall. Here, I'm just going to focus on the individual healthcare provider level. Fisher and uh, his researchers comment that the mindset of practicing in a cultural context begins with self-reflection, and they offer a few approaches that will help healthcare providers in this process. So in examining and reflecting about one's own culture and its influence on oneself, some questions that healthcare providers can pose to themselves are, what is my background? How might it have influenced my values, beliefs, and ways of being and living? How might my own culture influence the way I feel about illness, death, and loss, and how I express my feelings and thoughts about these life passages. Uh, questions should also be asked um, and reflected upon about one's own cultural biases. So questions that one can ask oneself is, how do I feel about certain people? Where might these feelings and beliefs have arisen? How are these biases interfering with my ability to provide compassionate whole person care to my patients and their families. Open dialogue with others can also facilitate self-growth and can increase the awareness of understanding on others' parts. And then, of course, acquiring information and education about the sociology of culture can also add uh, to uh, one's, um, one's um, culturally aware end-of-life practice. So given the discussion so far, and I've been doing all the talking, I apologize, um, I would not be surprised if this is overwhelming. It was for me as I was reading this information and preparing this presentation. And I wouldn't be surprised if you're thinking, how am I going to know all this about so many different cultures, religions, people, etc.? The point that I've tried to make throughout this presentation is that an individual's preferences for end-of-life care is influenced by their beliefs and values about life, dying, and death, and that this is developed from many sources, including culture, religion, life experiences, reading, and education over their life course. Thus, one cannot and probably and should not uh, assume that all members of a specific cultural or ethnic group will want or need the same things. Understanding each patient's and their family's cultural needs and preferences is essential to providing palliative care in a manner that conforms to the individual's values and ideals. Asking a series of open-ended questions about an individual's culture can provide insight into the person's values, beliefs, and needs in the context of advanced and incurable illness. So the next few slides, um, I'm going to share examples of questions that can be used to ask about preferences related to communication, cultural values, and customs. These are questions that were uh, prepared uh, for physicians, but I think can be adapted and used by all healthcare professionals. So when uh, you're thinking about communication, some of the open-ended questions um, that one can ask are, some people want to know everything about their medical conditions and others do not. How much would you like to know? Do you prefer to make medical decisions yourself or do you prefer your family decide for you? Would you like to be in the room when I speak to your family? With regard to uh, cultural 
cultural values, uh, one can ask, is there anything that would be, excuse me, helpful for me to know about uh, how you and your family view serious illness? Are there cultural beliefs, practices, or preferences that might affect you at times of significant illness? What concerns do you have about death? Are there things that are important to you and your family that I should know about? And the latter two questions um, should be considered if the patient is open to discussions about death. In, in terms of uh, customs, you can ask questions such as, are there any specific practices that you would like to have in the hospital or home? Are there aspects of medical care that you wish to forego or have withheld because of your cultural beliefs? Is there anything that is discouraged or forbidden? Are there any specific practices that are important to you at the time of death or afterward that we should know about? And um, often it's important to uh, uh, hear back what the patient understood from what you were telling them. So a good question to ask is, can you tell me in your own words what you have heard from me and what's most important to you about what I have said? So in summary then, an individual's culture is influenced not only by their ethnicity, but other learned beliefs and values that evolve over a person's life. Cultural diversity is associated, uh, well, cultural diversity at end of life is associated with differing belief systems regarding death and dying. Healthcare providers are challenged to provide care within the context of an individual's biopsychosocial needs. Open communication aimed at understanding how each person's belief system shapes their palliative care and terminal care needs forms the basis of optimal care. And despite disparate beliefs, universal care needs valued at the end of life include the provision of comfort, appropriate communication between healthcare provider and patient, respect for spiritual beliefs, and the opportunity for the dying person to say goodbye. So taking the time to understand each patient's unique cultural needs, values, and beliefs is the most respectful way of delivering palliative care and facilitating a dignified death. So uh, here are the references, uh, key references that I used in the preparation um, of this presentation. And I thank you so much